This is Cultural Mixtapes. I'm Tejas Srinivasan. Welcome to the show. I've been interested in this genre of abstract hip-hop for a while now. The classification has existed for many years, usually referring to rappers and artists who make perhaps more esoteric music than mainstream hip-hop artists. Kenny Siegel has been a consistent presence over the past decade or so and received several accolades for his production. He's worked with acclaimed rappers such as Billy Woods, Rap Ferreira, and Serengeti, and he's a member of the LA-based group the Jefferson Park Boys. His latest project, Maps, with New York rapper Billy Woods, was rated as one of Pitchfork's best new albums. It was put on the loved list by Anthony Fantano at The Needle Drop, a critic whom I follow almost religiously and it was aggregated to universal acclaim on Metacritic. Kenny's production, like most of my favorite musicians, escapes easy description. He has an affinity for jazzy melodies and acoustic drum-based rhythms, but even those can change from album to album. It's almost as if he's entirely changing his palette from one album to the next and reinventing himself each time. This versatility is exactly why I wanted to talk to him about his work and collaborations. We spoke about his recent album with Woods, the current U.S. and Europe tour that they're on, and got into the weeds about his music-making process. Towards the end of our conversation, we also spoke about this question of genre, and you can hear his thoughts on why this separate classification of underground or abstract hip-hop even exists. Before we get on with the interview, you're going to hear a clip from Kenny's 2021 solo project titled Indoors. The song is called Little Dinosaurs. Hope you enjoy the show. Kenny Siegel, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I uh, first want to start off with the fact that you and Billy Woods just finished the American leg of your tour. How were those shows? Uh, the sh- shows were awesome. I think almost all of them were sold out, which is definitely a new thing for me. Uh, the energy was great. Crowds were crazy. Uh, everything is super positive. Like, I mean, the ironic thing is that this album is kind of about the trials and tribulations of indie touring, which I've Mm -hmm. done a lot of that over the last 15, 20 years. Although this tour, so I mean, all touring has trials and tribulations. Like all touring has a lot of sitting around and waiting, a lot of being in uncomfortable spaces, uh, not being able to use the restroom when you want to like, like all just basic human indignities. But I would say that this tour has been pretty nice every night talking at the merch like woods is very big on uh us spending time at the merch booth selling all the merch ourselves and then also being willing to sign and talk to people which sometimes takes like two hours after the show like it's it's like a whole separate job that being said it's also like really cool interacting with all these people and so it's it's been great I am curious. He's famous for his anonymity. Does he come out just with the mask on? Is that what it is? No, not at all. Like, so in person, he does not in any way obscure his uh, Oh, really? Okay. His uh, face. I mean, when people ask to take pictures, he'll take a picture, but he puts like his hand in front of his face mm-hmm. or something like that. Uh, that's another thing that's crazy to me is how respectful the fans are. Like, I feel like most artists, once they've reached like his amount of uh, acclaim, mm-hmm. wouldn't be able to maintain the whole like you can't see my face thing. But yeah, I mean, I, I haven't Googled it any time recently, but like <laughs> at least before this tour, if you Googled Woods, you still like there might be like one picture you can find that has an unobscured picture of his face. And oh, even wow. that wasn't like very uh, clear. Uh, so and in fact, most of the times where it says it's his face, if you use Google, it's clear. It's like either a lucid or someone else that's clearly not Woods, oh, like okay. is the picture that it has. Uh, so he's somehow managed to like, like that's pretty crazy to me that yeah. people are so respectful. Like even when I see people tag us in footage of the shows, they typically put like an emoji over his face or mm-hmm. take a shot where it's like from the neck down or something like, so yeah, people are really respectful about that. That's great. Um, so your new album, Maps, with Billy Woods came out in early May, and this is your second full-length project with him. Um, you've worked on other projects like Little Songs before, as well as with his group. 
And I'm interested in starting out with what exactly about a rapper or an artist captivates you to develop projects with, because as a producer, you're basically making the canvas for language. So how do you get into projects? In general, first of all, I definitely prefer doing whole projects with people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not always possible in every situation, but to me, I don't really make like the standout. I make like album tracks, I think, like mm -hmm. my beats. They're not normally like the single or the standout song on something. I really like to be in control of the mix of my songs. I, I think there's a lot of like, especially like my beats are normally pretty simple. Like a lot of the finishing work, like the mixing and mastering, like is really important when it's something simple because there's only like a few elements. If they're not all perfect, then it's kind of like the whole thing is ruined in my, in my eyes at least. Mm -hmm. And when I'm doing like one song on a random album, often you don't have control over the mix or the master or any of the finishing touches. Sometimes you don't even have control over like a lot of times when I send a beat to someone, I don't consider the beat finished. I know some producers have like all the like choruses and verses and bridges all mapped out in an yeah. arrangement. A lot of times when I'm sending beats to like to Woods or to Rory or someone like that, it's just like a little loop or something. That's like an idea that I'm hoping will spark an idea with them. And then once they kind of show me where they're headed with it, that's when I'll flesh it out with more stuff that goes with the song. And when there's a whole album, I'm normally, I can do that whole process. And I'm somewhat in control of the timeline and the process. When you're just like a cog in someone else's big project and you have one track, a lot of times I might like open Mike Eagle, someone who I've done a number of songs with over the years, but always like one song on a project. A lot of times those beats, like I gave it to him. And then like two years later, he's like, oh yeah, it's like the main song. It's like the single on my new album or something like that. Yeah. And I had like no input and no, no you know mike i mean I, I love working with mike and he's the homie but like that to me is not where i excel like with my music so i try to put myself in situations where i'm gonna get to do what i consider the where I, i'll excel the most basically when you're working on a full album with a rapper do you like to have a general idea of the content of the lyrics first or do you just put out beats and then let them come back to you uh, it evolves. I mean, every pro normally most projects, we don't know what it's like maps. The only thesis statement we had before we started working on it was that we didn't want to do hiding places part two. Like okay. we did not sit down and say like, hey, let's do an album about touring or let's do an album about traveling like that kind of came as the project started evolving. Uh, typically, most projects start with me sending a fairly large beat pack that has stuff that's all over the map that I don't okay. intend uh, like I never intend that initial beat pack to be all of them on the album because I normally am throwing out things that don't go together necessarily just to kind of see what help them catch a vibe with something. Yeah. Once we get a song or two, that kind of informs me a little bit of where we're going, but it's not, it's normally like once we're like 25 to 30% into the project, that's when I start thinking about what you were saying. I start really cluing in on the lyrics I uh, think if you do too much of that early on, you can pigeonhole yourself into. And also another thing I'd say is every artist works differently. Mm -hmm. And I try my best as a producer that I tailor it to how that artist works. Mm -hmm. Like some artists like to have a plan. Some artists like to do everything. Spon like Rory, for instance, who I've done a number of projects with at Rat Ferreira, like he's very spontaneous. Like a lot of times we're flying by the seat of our pants mm -hmm. on a project. But also every project is different because like when we did Purple Moonlight Pages, for instance, that one had a little bit more of a thesis statement. Like we knew that this was going to be a Jefferson Park Boys thing. We knew that we were trying to do a lot of live instrumentation. Like that one, I knew going in a little bit more of what we we're trying to do. Uh, Maps was, yeah, I, I gave Woods a bunch of beats that I thought were not at all like hiding places. <laughs> Uh, the funny thing is that I think I said this uh, in a different interview, like of the initial like 15 or so beats I sent him, I only one of them is actually on maps from that oh, first wow. beat pack. Okay. Uh, the second beat pack, most of them are on maps. Uh, and the third beat pack, like, it, like after that, like I was much more dialed into what we we're doing. Uh, but yeah, I really didn't know what we were doing in the beginning. So I was just sending a bunch of ideas. So that, in fact, 
of that initial beat pack, one of those is actually now an Arm and Hammer song, and a couple yeah. of them are on the Pink Naval album that's going to come out later this year. Oh, really? Uh, it's just like all, yeah. You just never know. And I'm, I can't say I never like make a beat for a person, but typically I'm not the type of person that sits down like, all right, I got to make Billy Woods beats today, or I got to make Rap Ferrero beats. Today. That's just not how I operate. I just make mm-hmm. beats, and then after the fact, maybe I'll be like, oh, this sounds like something that so and so would be good on, but. Uh, but I rarely like sit down or when I do try to do that, it normally doesn't turn out good. So I normally okay. just try and make whatever I'm feeling at the time. And you said that after you send them a bunch of beats and then you guys work through to specify anything for the specific project, do you have an example of how a certain topical idea or a lyric or something like that affected the beat and how that changed? Good question. I'm trying to think of a good one from Maps. Well, so the single FaceTime, for instance, Mm -hmm. FaceTime, the original beat was just the like sample that's like chopped up and the drums. It didn't have the it didn't have the bass note. It didn't have the the uh, saxophone or any of that stuff. Uh, And originally it was just raps. And then when we were like, okay, we should do this court, we were going to ask Sam to do a chorus. Sam came back with a chorus like almost immediate. Normally things like that take a while, like literally, like, I think it was like day up. We like text him like, yo, would you hop on this? And he like sent back the demo of it that he was intending on doing a better recording of it, but we loved it so much. We're like, this is it. Uh, And then we sat with it for a while. And the song was basic. That song was done for quite a while, just like that. And I was the one that was like, this is not done to me. It's not, there's, it still needs something. And that's when I had my friend Aaron Shaw come over and do the saxophone. And and Woods was actually initially skeptical. He's like, dude, that song is perfect. It's already oh, like yeah. a single, like you shouldn't fuck with it. And I was like, nah, nah, nah. Like, okay. trust me, this is yeah. going to be good. But I'm trying to think of ones that had a bigger, like, like that. It's not like a huge evolution. There's definitely beats that like, Right. Well, well, so one other thing I'll say about FaceTime is FaceTime went through a lot of, of all the beats on the album. That one went through so many evolutions. What you hear on the record is very similar to the original demo I made of the beat, okay. just with the saxophone. But along the ride, I drastically changed the beat. And then we decided to put it back the way it was. I didn't add a ton of elements, but I changed the arrangement. So it would stick. Right now, it kind of goes between two chords. And there's a version of it where I stuck on just the first chord for almost the entire verse for each verse. And that was the difference between the verse and the chorus is it would just stick on one chord the whole way through. And then just right before the chorus would come in, it would hit the second chord. And then the chorus had the two chords. And and it had more like starts and stops that kind of went with some of his punchlines in the song. Yeah, And it was cool. He pointed out because sometimes you lose the forest for the trees. Originally, I thought it was just too basic. And I was like, we need to do more. I need to like do something else. And I thought I was like adding all the starts and stops to kind of like punch up his lyrics in different ways. And like, I I thought it was like adding something. But what he pointed out at the end was that it was the second chord that gave it this like melancholy feel. Mm -hmm. And when you took that out, the whole song, it was, it was like engaging the new arrangement I made, but also like there was this like melancholy, wistful kind of Mm. vibe to the track that to him was like the core of what the whole thing was about was that, was that mood. And it kind of lost that mood a little bit when it didn't do the two chords during the verse. And that once he pointed that out to me, I couldn't unhear it again because I I was strongly advocating that I thought the other version was better at first. And then I was like, oh, you're right. I missed the forest for the trees. Like this song is really about that feeling that that's Mm -hmm. the most important part of it. It's not whether I have like a flashy breakdown or like a cool dropout that sounds dope like that really is irrelevant if we're like not having that initial emotion that it was all about. And that kind of convinced me to go back to what the original arrangement was. I think there's like one dropout in the song now. Like, but yeah, like a lot of times the song, I just like to let the song dictate where we're going. Uh, another one would be, oh, As the Crow Flies, that beat was originally just the first half of that beat. That, so that okay. one wasn't so much intentional. That was a happy accident change. Uh, that beat was really a beat that I made. It's like sampling my friend Ryan Crosby, who also played the guitars on uh, Spongebob and a bunch of the songs on Hiding Mm. Places. So me and him have like a splice 
sample pack we had made a while back. Okay. Uh, so he had recorded just a bunch of guitars at my house for that. And the guitar kind of chords, the kind of spooky stuff at the beginning of As the Crow Flies, that was something I chopped out of that recording session we did for the splice pack. Mm -hmm. uh, and I started that beat. I had the bass and the drums. And that was one where the beat was already tight. I'd already given it to Woods. He was loving it. And I think Chaz maybe had even done that verse on it. But okay. originally it was just going to be the rest. Chaz is elusive. Originally it was just going to be that beat that's the first half of that beat. And that was uh -huh. going to be the whole song. And Woods hadn't written his part yet. But I kind of knew that that song could be something more. Uh, but it wasn't that intentional. So then I had my friend, uh, Mr. Carmack, this Aaron was over. And I was playing him that beat and he just hopped on my roads and started jamming on it a little bit. And I was like, Oh, that sounds dope, dude. I was like, hold on a second. I like threw the mic up. Yeah. I uh, recorded him on the roads. And before I knew it, he had laid down all this parts that I was like, Oh, this changes this into a whole new thing. Uh, then uh, I had my friend Mike Parvizi come by. Cause it, I was like, Oh, you know what? Like it'd be dope. The baseline changes up too. And now it'll be like a Jefferson park boys thing. Mm -hmm. So then I come back to Woods like, yo, this okay. beat is drastically changed. Check this out. And he, he loved it, luckily. Uh, but that was definitely one where like, yeah, like shit happened. Like it's just like uh, following to me. I'm always I just try to be open to. I think a lot of the dopest parts of my music are happy accidents that happen mm -hmm. uh, along the way. So I try to be very open to that and not too rigid on like, oh, it needs it's done or it needs to be like this or that. Like I try to be very open to like noticing when something cool happens and when something cool happens, let's drop everything else and just focus in on that and like yeah. pursue that, which sometimes means getting rid of like large parts of the rest of the beat. In this case, it ended up melding everything together. But yeah, like sometimes I'll have a beat where, yeah, like something happens and I'm like, oh shit, we're getting rid of like everything except for that one little bit and yeah. then building on that because that's like the dopest part. You talked about all these people that you were working with and even in the course of this album. And then you mentioned that when you're making beats, you don't originally specify who this is going to and who's going to sound good on top of it. And this has always interested me in like collaborations when whether one person has to tailor their style to adapt the other person's vision. And I'm thinking of a couple albums that represent this well, like Freddie Gibbs, one of my favorite rappers. If you take two of his albums, Bandana and Alfredo, one's with Mad Lib, one's with The Alchemist, but they're both Freddie Gibbs records, but they're also very different and you can associate them with the producer. When you're approaching those collaborations, how do you manage your sound and keep that consistent throughout the process. One thing that I would say is different from me and Mad Lib or Alchemist, the two examples you mm. just gave, who, by the way, I, I love their beats and I would consider them both like influences on me without a doubt. But I think both of them have more of a distinctive. It's funny because me and Woods actually just went into this on that Professor Sky podcast a little bit. He, he was quizzing Woods about what it was that made my beats different. Uh -huh. And like, I like to think that although there's definitely a general aesthetic that I think my beats, all my albums have, like, mm -hmm. I try to be the one that crafts my sound to the artist, like more okay. so than like, like Mad Lib or Alchemist, I think they have like a very like, this is my sound. Yeah. And when you do an album with Alchemist, it's going to be the Alchemist sound. Yeah. Like, and when you do an album with Mad Lib, it's going to be that Mad Lib sound or like DJ Premier, like, like most of the people that are my biggest like influences pete rock they all have like these very specific formula i think is going too far because i don't think that another person could do their formula and sound the same as them but mm -hmm. like they definitely have like ingredients and uh that make their sound yeah. i like to think that for myself i have a general aesthetic that i like but i try my best to every not just every artist but every album i do to craft a sound that's specific to that album but like purple moonlight pages with rap ferrera and you listen to hiding places or if you listen to a jai they all sound very different to me like yeah. purple moonlight pages yeah. is like very jazzy i know people keep on saying maps is jazzy to me maps is more like i guess kind of traditional hip-hop beats for me at least mm -hmm. uh hiding places has like a lot of like electronic and like yeah dark psychedelic elements to it a Jai is another one that's like much more like sample based hip hop, like uh, with a nod kind of more to the 90s sound. Like 
to me, like each one of these have very distinct tones and it'd be hard to, I think it, you'd be harder pressed to say like what Kenny's sound is. Mm -hmm. That being said, I do realize that there's like kind of a unifying aesthetic to all of those albums as different as they are. Yeah. And I can't really tell you what it is that I'm doing to get that because I do different things on each of those. Like even my process of making the beats is often changes from time to time. Mm -hmm. And I'm certainly not sitting around ever thinking about what makes a Kenny Siegel beat or how to make a Kenny Siegel. Like, I feel like that would be not a fun rabbit hole to explore in yeah. my own head. So it just ends up being that way. Uh, and I don't have a great answer of what, how I reach that aesthetic, except for I'm just using my tape. Like, I think a lot of how I make beats in general is like, I kind of like collage sounds together and I mm -hmm. have a certain sensibility of what I think sounds cool or when to stop. Like, like a lot of times when you're making like a painter or a sculptor, it's like, how do you know when it's done? Like I have some aesthetic in my head of when I know something sounds right to me. Mm -hmm. And that I guess is what makes the Kenny Siegel sound. That is my distinctive sound, I guess. Like, so yeah, I don't know if that fully answered your question. But no, that's interesting because let's take your solo work then. Do you change the way you approach your projects on like banking? So that's why I have so few solo albums. I mean, I know I have the Ken Instrumentals album. To me, like the Ken yeah. Instrumentals albums are like beat tapes of like, they're normally like over half of the beats are from albums that have already come out, like mm -hmm. instrumentals. The To me, like Happy Little Trees and Indoors, those are actual solo instrumental albums. Mm -hmm. And the reason I don't have very many of those is I struggle to do that a lot of times. Like I work better when I have someone to play off of, I think, mm -hmm. uh, or it's just easier for me. Like, I don't know if work better is the right word because I think indoors and happy little trees are great albums when, yeah. but those are much, there's a lot more, it's a lot more painful birthing process for me to make an instrumental album than for me to make a rap album. I don't have a great answer to why that is, like it's a lot harder for me to like there, every album there's a moment where i'm like in the matrix and i like see the big picture of what's going on and instrumental ones it takes me a lot longer sometimes both of those albums i spent like i didn't talk about it the whole time i was working on them but i spent years on both of those albums oh, wow. like not not like working on them actively i mean i mm. did many projects over the course of those years but those are like the type of things where it's not like like a jai that was an album that happened very quickly. Me and Getty, like, like mm -hmm. over the course of like a few months, like put oh, that wow. whole project together. Uh, even Maps, which wasn't that quick, it was less than a year, like that oh, we worked wow. on it. And I and I made two other albums during the same, like 2022. I didn't put out any work at mm -hmm. all, but I made four albums over the course of yeah. that year, including that. But Indoors, I think beginning inklings of that album were like probably two years before that album came out like oh, that wow. i started thinking about it and... how do you get into if you're trying to make an, a solo instrumental track what prompts you to go that direction how do you get into that whereas if it's like if it's not billy woods texting you hey can you make me a beat what drives you towards an instrument a solo project so i guess similarly to what i was saying with beats i don't really set off to like oh this is going to be an instrumental beat not a rap mm. beat i really just make ideas uh -huh. and then i take those ideas and i put them in the buckets i typically have like itunes playlists in my itunes on my studio computer that are just mm -hmm. filled with like hey these are good ideas for like th these beats that i've made all seem to kind of go together like yeah. hey here's like unspecified future instrumental project like these are some ideas like because some beats like i finish them and i'm like hey this is clearly a rap beat mm -hmm. some beats i finish them and i'm like hey i don't know if anyone could ever rap on this and i put them in a different category now often i think uh rory uh rap ferrer has even told this story before there's like one or two of our beats oh maybe it was sorcerer i think it's a song sorcerer that we have there was like one or two songs of ours that like I first told him when he was like looking through folders on my beats, I was like, Oh, these are like unwrappable beats. He's like, give them to me. And then he like made amazing songs on yeah. them. Uh, but yeah, uh, often I'll have like maybe a one or two playlists that are like beats that I think could be fleshed out into something instrumental, or I think there's enough there that there's like something that doesn't need vocals to get something interesting. But I'm also never like that locked into any of that because there's an MC over and he says he likes a beat that I thought was going to be on an instrumental album. Like, 
I'm probably going to give it to them if I mm-hmm. think it's a good idea. Like I, to me, I'm also, yeah, very go with the flow, like trying, if something sounds like a good idea, then let's try it. Like what's the harm? Worst yeah. things, worst, like I'll say, yo, this song sucks. Let's not use it. It's interesting because in production, what I've found is it's a difficult, Phineas says this too. He says it's a very regimented job. You go into the studio, you do X, Y, Z, and you're done. And the difficulty with judging beats is that it's fairly easy to assemble a rudimentary beat, but you can spend days, weeks, months perfecting it. How do you know when a beat is done at the end of the process when you're working with someone going back and forth? I mean, you just know. Like that it's to me, funny. that okay. if, if anything, that's like one of the things that defines my sound is that mm-hmm. I know when it has the right elements. And and my beats normally have very few elements in them. Uh, I strive to like keep things fairly simple. I've also done music in the past for like TV shows and stuff like that. I used to have a job like about a decade ago at a company where we did music for like TV and movies and video Mm -hmm. games. And there, when you're working with a client, often like you're done when they, well, well, you're always, you're done when they approve it. And there's often like a phase towards the end where you're just throwing shit at the wall, trying to make them happy. They're like, Hey, you know, what if it was like a little bit more exciting at this part and you just throw some like riser noises and some big crash symbols on it. And they're like, Hey, what if it was like even more exciting? And you're like, all right, let's have a fucking laser riser on top of this. And they're like, not exciting enough. You're like, all right, we'll have like a snare roll on top. And you're just literally just throwing shit at the wall. And a lot of times those songs, by the time I would turn it in, like something that I was maybe kind of proud of the original demo when I played it for the client and they yeah. said they liked it, by the time it actually is approved and everything, I would be like, what is this monstrosity? I hate this. It has all these sounds that I would never put in it yeah. that ruined the whole vibe. So I feel like I learned a lot of lessons from that, mm-hmm. of that when I think something's not right on, on something of my own, the last thing I do is try and add another element to try and fix it like because to me those are like band-aids basically Mm -hmm. you're just trying to like paper over the fact that at its core it's not really the right thing yeah uh and for my own music like if something's not working my first thought is like let's delete something out of this beat and see like what what parts do i like Mm -hmm. and what's not working let's just get rid of the thing i don't like and maybe we'll replace it with something or maybe it's just dope with no drums or maybe it's dope with no bass sound or whatever it was that wasn't working for me uh so yeah i think that really having that old job like really Mm -hmm. informed my whole approach of often carving away at things as opposed to adding new things Mm -hmm. uh but yeah i you know it's done when it just feels right and and i'll also say this like I sound like super decisive. Like when I'm talking here, like I'm not always super decisive. Like sometimes I'm tweaking things right until the very last minute. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm also try to be open to the idea of making a drastic change, even when we're like almost done with something, because if it's not right, I've had enough things come out at this point where I have to live with it forever. Yeah. That I'm like over the idea of if it, if I'm not a hundred percent, with it then like let's keep on trying because mm-hmm. right now it might be annoying to go back to the drawing board on something i thought was finished but that's way less annoying than for the next 20 years having to hear that song and being annoyed by it mm. uh, um i want to get further into the weeds of you making a beat you said you like to make a bunch of beats store them in little buckets and then send them send out larger files to other artists when you make a beat i guess really specifically how if you have an example that you can take me through when you're crafting a beat, people do it a hundred different ways. How do you craft a beat? That's a tough question for me too. Cause I do it a hundred different ways. One thing that I've definitely tried to do is not have a formulaic way of how I approach music. Mm-hmm. Uh, and not only over the years has it evolved, but even within like the same batch of beats, I try not to like, I don't have a form. Some people like load up a bunch of cool drum sounds. They make a drum beat. Then they try a different sample. I definitely do do that sometimes. I am often start with just a sound that I think sounds cool. Mm. Like, like, I guess the most basic generic thing I can say of how I make a beat is I find a sound that sounds like it inspires me in some way. That could be like a melodic loop. It could be a drum sound. It could be a sound effect. It could be mm. some weird... I mean, shit, the beat... Uh, is it called Checkpoints? The one that has that weird, like, lasery snare sound uh, from Hiding Places. Mm-hmm. Uh like that was a beat where I literally like 
thought that was just the goofiest noise. And I was like, let me try and use this noise in something. Like, I don't know why. Like, I just had that as a thesis. And then the, those guitars was like, it was never intended to be used, really. I, I, I think I just got my electric guitar fixed. And I'm not a great guitar player. And I I literally plugged it in directly into the computer. It's not even through an amp. That's why the guitar sounds so shitty on that particular song. Yeah. And it's like some little noodle of me playing and it was really just i like kind of looped it on that snare sound because it just sounded cool to me like i was like oh this is like something it's like really raw sounding then i played the omnichord part on that beat uh mm -hmm. i think that that was at a time when i i hadn't just gotten the omnichord but it was like fairly new yeah. to me and like i was just putting it on every like pretty much anything i started like at that time i'd be like let's try the omnichord on it yeah. And I was constantly trying to do new things with it. So I had the Omnichord through some pedals at that time. And I was like, wow, this spooky ass sound sounds dope. And then uh, what else is in that beat? But yeah, that was like kind of the beginning of it. And then I probably like lived with it for a while like that. And around that time, I got the circuit bent Casio keyboard. That's what the other keyboard, there's like two okay. keyboard parts in it. There's like the Omnichord, which is like that chord sound. Mm. But then there's also like a kind of like single note melody and yeah. that oh wait am i i'm actually you know what the casio is not on that beat i'm sorry the single note melody is on spider hole with the casio one but my point is i just try and like get inspired by sounds like another approach would be like trying to think of another beat that has a great story uh okay so uh the danny brown one uh mm -hmm. year zero yeah that beat really started with a sample or there's two samples from two different records and like a drum and like the drums like that that was how that started and in fact the drums it's like there's like a kick and a snare but there's a lot of like other sounds and what that is is uh i got married in 2019 and at our mm -hmm. wedding we had like these little tiny uh i think i have some right here hold on a second these little uh these little tambourines that like the guests had. So I have over there in my studio, a big box of like, somehow at the end we had like a, like a cardboard box. And I was like, I want that whole box. Like I know I'll do something with them someday. So like not just holding one of these, I had the whole box of them and I'm like kind of just shifting it around near the microphone. And that's a lot of the like noise that you hear like mm -hmm. with it. And I had all that. And that was like, that was cool. It was already a beat. Uh, and it might've just stayed like that. Cause I just liked, I liked the way that, that the two samples just sounded hard. I was yeah. really trying to do something like at that point we had been doing maps for a little bit. I was aware that we had a lot of jazzy things at that point. I was looking for something a little harder to add to the album. Uh, and then a friend came over and he had this weird drum machine that okay. he was showing me by Soma since it's like a, this very, very esoteric, weird drum machine. So we were jamming with it for a second at, at my studio and I hooked up the Omnichord because that's like my favorite thing to jam with. And I put that through some, through like a distortion pedal, which isn't a normal thing I do, but I've, I've done it before, okay. but I put it through a distortion or reverb because it just went like the drum machine had a very industrial sound. And we were kind of making this nine inch nailsy kind of jam and mm -hmm. I recorded it, but nothing really came up. It was really just more for fun. We weren't trying to do anything, make a song together necessarily and then he left and i was like so jazzed up by that jam session that i just like loaded back up that beat that i'd been working yeah. on before he came there and i i was just listening to it in ableton and i i still had the the omnicord hooked up so i like just started jamming with the omnicord i was like oh shit that sounds really good on this yeah so all of the like distortion and like wailing noises that's mm -hmm. all the omnicord and in fact my omnicord one of the is also certain almost all my here is circuit bent in various ways so the omnicord has this uh has like a pitch knob that it wouldn't normally have that lets you pitch the entire machine up and down okay so that melody that kind of comes in on year zero that sounds like almost like a wailing guitar what it is i'm just holding one note on the omnicord and i'm using that pitch oh. knob to hit like different notes with it. And I didn't even play it exactly the way it sounded. Like I had to chop it up to make it like so precise. Cause it's literally very imprecise. You have like four octaves on this little knob. So yeah. like it's going all over the place. Uh, but I hit some notes that I thought sounded cool. Yeah. I made some cool bends and then I chopped that into the full melody that I was hearing uh -huh. and then added that to the beat. And then I was like, oh shit, now this is a beat. Like before it was a beat but it was kind of typical or it wasn't typical, but it wasn't like special to me. And that was like 
so yes, yeah, like how I know something's done. It's like when something happens and I'm like, oh shit, that is special. Mm-hmm. That's when I'm like, oh, now we're we're cooking with something here. You said that your friend came over, you jammed, and then you took that idea. I think you said something like that on an interview a few years ago, how you take jam sessions recorded with other people, treat them like samples, and then intersperse them. Would you say that that, as well as the other ways you create music, do you try to eradicate any linearity in the way you do things from point A to point B from start to end? Or Yes. I mean, it, and it, I don't want to act like thinking too hard about that. Mm-hmm. But just in, it's like a couple things. A, it's boring to just do the same thing for me, at least. Yeah. Some people thrive with that. Like I know people that love process. They love doing the same thing over and mm. over again. That makes them like feel good. To me, I get bored about with that after a while. So I'm constantly like trying to switch it up, and I'm also constantly like, ultimately like, and I don't know how I feel. I know at least back in the day. I used to feel so I used to do a lot of drum and bass also like this is like almost 20 years ago I was making drum and bass beats Mm -hmm. and I never had a lot of success with it mainly because I never liked to conform to the way other people made drum and bass 32 bar intro going into a fake drop going into another 32 bars before the real drop and then like there's a 16 bar drop and then you have the main I didn't like doing that. I would have a song that maybe started with a drop or a song that like was ambient and then busts into the main piece with nothing. Like, yeah. like I just like fooling around with shit. And in the drum and bass scene, especially back in the late nineties, early two thousands, like nobody was trying to have that. Like there wasn't a lot of listening drum and bass. There was only DJ dr- drum and bass songs for DJs to play at raves. And you couldn't play my songs cause they didn't mix easily because they were all the, the wrong speed or had the wrong format. Yeah. And initially what really drew me into hip hop was that I met all the guys in Project Blowed who were very nonconformist hip hop people and they were all rapping on weird beats. And I was like, oh shit, I can do whatever zany arrangement or weird idea I want. Yeah. So that kind of, so early on, I guess, I like learned this lesson of that. I don't think I'm really good at, if I'm just competing at trying to sound like what everyone else is doing, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be a winner at that. That's not my forte. And if I try and make beats like Premiere, beats like Mad Lib or something like that, that's not where I'm ever going to win because I don't do that well. I make beats like myself. So I started to embrace more and more like just do whatever the hell sounds good to me. And hopefully that'll be different than what other people are doing, because as long as it's different, it's harder to compare it directly to like, oh, that's not as good as a Pete Rock beat. Like, yeah. Uh, so that was kind of, I think, and this is again, like so many years ago, like, I don't know if I really think like this necessarily now, but it's just evolved into what I do now. But like, part of it was just me being aware of like my strengths and weaknesses and trying to play to my strengths and not to my weaknesses kind of, I guess. Uh, um, I want to switch gears a little bit and I'm interested in this question of genre. Um, the album with Billy Woods and most of Billy Woods' stuff is classified as underground rap on Apple Music, and that seems to be like a thread that people use to classify it. I've not fully bought into this idea that these artists such as Woods yourself, Aesop Rock, Mos Def, it seems like people act like they don't fully fit into this larger genre of hip-hop. And you spoke on another podcast with Sam Buck saying that I'm the type of hip-hop producer making albums that skirt the line of losing the plot of real hip-hop. Can you say more about this and why you think that exists, basically, this extra category? I mean, I think that that part of why I'm more celebrated these days and thriving so much is because mm-hmm. I don't think that that matters as much. Yeah. Certainly when I was coming up, like, like I mean, even back, like, when I switched from drum and bass into hip hop. So for many years, I DJed for Abstract Rude, who's like a big rapper from the Project Blow Los Angeles scene. Mm-hmm. And that was and it was back when he was at the height of his uh, popularity. Yeah, uh, and he was signed to Rhyme Sayers at the time. Uh, for a while, he was signed to Battle Axe. Uh, when I used to tour with him, one thing that would like be weird for me was that I was into all of like the weird fringes of hip hop, uh-huh. and he would often have I would DJ for him, but sometimes I would do like opening DJ sets. And these are normally on vinyl. This was like pre Serato or very beginning of Serato and stuff. Okay, uh, so it's like early to mid 2000s and then to the early 2010s like is what mm-hmm. i'm talking about uh so he would often like get on my case like yo don't play that weird shit we're trying to like like if you're doing the opening set your job is to like get the dance floor filled up with people and like yeah. 
And I was never really good at that because I always liked all this weird stuff and I never fully fit in. And it wasn't until a few years after that era that I went on a tour with bus driver and rap Ferrero that he was Milo mm-hmm. at the time. Okay. And I saw this crowd that bus driver drew to the shows and they were still hip hop fans, but they were down for anything. Yeah. And the weirder I got on stage, the weird, the more accolades I got, like they yeah. were so down for me to get super weird and like play super weird shit and expand their minds. And it was like this crazy light bulb went off for me. I was like, holy shit. I was just in front of the wrong people before. Mm -hmm. Like it was the wrong fan base that I was playing to. I needed to get with these fans or these people because there is people that want to hear weird shit. I just didn't know who they were. And I think even then, and that would have been like 2014, I think that I went on Mm -hmm. that tour with Bus Driver. Even then, things were still pretty separate. Like, there was weird hip-hop and there was, like, regular hip-hop. Yeah. I feel in 2023, these distinctions matter very little at this yeah. point. Uh, I think that everything is weird. I mean, shit, if you listen to the hip-hop on the radio, it's fucking weird as hell. Like, I mean, it's weird in a different way, but, like, auto-tuned with, like, weird minimal trap beats that are, like, post-trap and stuff, like, that shit's hella weird, too. In fact, if you had played that to me in... 2003 i probably would have told you that was some alien music like not not hip-hop at all. i might have told you that it wasn't hip-hop at all uh so i think just everything is expanded and changed and i think that those distinctions matter less mm-hmm. that being said it, the specific comment you were saying i think that was about kendrick lamar's album is what i was talking yeah. about and i think that sometimes and i'm very conscious of i try to be conscious of this like as much as I like to like do things that are weird and just pursue whatever I'm um, like sounds sound mm-hmm. cool to me at the moment, I do know enough about real hip hop that I try to still have it be something that if you're a real hip hop head that you can still somewhat get down with like what okay. we're doing. And sometimes I think, especially with jazzy, and this is part, and this will also tie back to you were asking about me collaborating with musicians and having mm-hmm. people come over and jam. Part of why. I, I'm not always big on having people just play parts on my songs. Why I'd rather like jam for a little bit and then chop it up like a yeah. sample is that I think it's real easy, especially with jazz and hip hop to get into like some super corny territory. Like when you start yeah. adding live instrumentation to hip hop, traditionally over the years, it is more often than not corny to me mm-hmm. and to keep it not corny, at least my approach to keep it not corny is this approach of making it more like I'm sampling them and treating it more the way I would if I was sampling a record where it's like chopped up a little bit, uh, maybe put out of context what they played. Uh, I don't know. It's just, that's Mm -hmm. my way of trying to achieve something that's like, and no shade to anyone who doesn't do that. Like I, it's just, that's my coping mechanism of trying to avoid even like, like electronic stuff with hip hop, for instance, Mm -hmm. and this will be a funny, funny little aside. So I don't know if you know, like the artist Machine Drum. No. Uh, he's like a big electronic artist. Okay. I love Machine Drum's current music. Like, I think he's brilliant. When he first came out in the early 2000s, he was okay. making like a very specific brand of electronic hip hop. I was not a fan of that at the okay. time. It was so mechanical to me. This was before Jay Dilla became real mm-hmm. big. Uh, and it wasn't really until the Jay Dilla era that electronic hip hop all of a sudden became much more interesting to me because originally electronic hip hop was like very rigid. Like the electronic element of it was made everything like very like, yeah, just cold and like Mm. non soulful to me. And I just wasn't into that. Now I don't love the fact that everyone and their mom like is a Jay Dilla clone either. Like I feel like that's super cool. Like they somehow made something that I love be corny as well, like with that. And that's partly why I don't think, even though I was, the biggest Dilla fan before people loved Dilla back when like, what was the tribe album when uh, the love movement came out and shit mm-hmm. like that. And, like Frank and Dank, like I was the biggest fan of that shit when it was first popping. Yeah. Somehow like since he became like so deified by everyone and after his passing, like I don't count myself as this mega Dilla fan anymore just cause it just, people just made it corny somehow <laughs> to, to love that. Like, I don't know. Uh, damn. I lost the plot of my own, uh, my own <laughs> anecdote here. Anyway, uh, but yes, I'm just, I just try to like, uh, there's just a lot of, when you start layering a bunch of musicians on top of a beat, it's very easy for it to go awry. Mm. And like, I try to pursue techniques 
that allow me to do all that stuff but still like hopefully don't like that's what i meant by don't lose the plot of hip-hop is mm-hmm. like like sometimes on that that newer kendrick album some of those songs i felt like were more like like an easy listening song or more yeah. like uh like like it just lost the the rawness i think really when i'm saying the plot of hip like there's a certain rawness to like hip-hop yeah that when you completely get rid of that like it gets real corny real quick to me. No, that definitely makes a lot of sense. And there were there were some great quotes from that Sam Buck interview. I think you were, you said something like Kendrick is doing what Kanye thinks he's doing. <laughs> that, yeah, I'll stand by that one. I think I, I think that's that's, I that's some real shit. Um, this kind of leads into my last question, which is, who have you been listening to lately that you've been excited about? So this is really random. My wife just put this on literally yesterday or the yeah. day before in the car. And I'm obsessed with this album by a group. It's actually from England. I'd never heard of them before. Mandy, Indiana, I think is what they're called. Mandy, Indiana. Yeah, I believe okay. that's what they're called. It is like industrial electronic rock, I guess I'd say. Okay. Okay. If you want to know the music I was into when I was in high school, I would say Mandy, Indiana is the modern equivalent of what I was listening to in high school. Okay. It's like lo-fi, like it, like sometimes they have like literally like it sounds like a 606 drum machine and a 303 like bass line. Okay. And then there'll be like distorted guitars and a woman like talking in French over top of it. Okay. Super weird. But that album is fucking amazing. I've been listening okay. to it nonstop the last couple of days. Okay. Uh, on some hip hop shit uh well i've been listening to a lot of lex friedman podcasts i i do enjoy that that guy had that guy i don't always agree with everything that he's about but he interviews some yeah. very interesting people uh especially about the ai stuff i've been real mm-hmm. fascinated with that recently uh let's see what else. i listened to the boat to the tecmo bowl album the recently not that long ago i listened to oh Oh, so this is actually the other thing I've been listening to. After the Professor Sky interview, I was being serious. I had not heard the Tyler, the Creator album, Call Me If You Get Lost. Before. Really? Uh, I had I'd heard of it. I knew that it existed. I didn't even know it was about traveling because he was trying to draw a lot of parallels between that and maps. Yeah. And he was shocked that me and Woods, neither of us had ever heard that album or knew anything about it. So I went and listened to it after that. That album is fucking amazing. That's mm-hmm. a really good album, oh, I gotta yeah. say. Uh, and I would also say that I, I think like Tyler might be one of the best producers in hip hop currently. Like, I, I think he's a great rapper too. But mm. like his production on the, because I think he produced the last couple albums of his too, right? Yeah. Like, like he he was the main producer on all of his recent albums. I'm not gonna say all of them are my favorite hip hop albums, mm-hmm. but he is firing on all cylinders, both in like his shit has a rawness to it and the commercialness at the same time he threads yeah. that that needle so well and does it in his own fresh voice like he's one of those people where i can i know the influences a little bit but he doesn't wear them on his sleeve he has his own take on it, his own sound like i don't know that call me if you get lost album was really good i thought I only listened through it twice i think but yeah. like but yeah i can tell i'm going to listen to that album a lot more that one and then flower boy is one of my favorite albums as well yeah flower boys is definitely great i i and it's funny i can't say he's like my favorite rapper i i haven't like i don't like listen to his his albums all the time or anything yeah. but every time i do i'm like damn you'd be like you were really fucking good so those are that's what i've listened there to recently go. but mandy in the indiana that shit was i i have a feeling a lot of people are gonna go listen to it and be very puzzled and be like what the hell is this but it's i'm it about really to go good. take a listen right after this as well I think my wife found it because it was in one of the articles that was like best album so far of the year. Mm-hmm. Like it was right next to maps because it was Mandy yeah. and you know or something like that. Yeah. But good call on her part to uh, to throw that out there. Wonderful. I will take a listen. All right. I believe that is all. Thank you so much for being here. This is great. Cool. This is fun. And that's our show. Special thanks to Kenny Siegel for joining me on this episode. To see a list of his recommendations and learn more about his work, visit the show notes. Cultural Mixtapes is written and produced by me, Teja Srinivasan. The music you heard on today's episode was Little Dinosaurs by Kenny Siegel from his album Indoors, as well as Beethoven's Sonata No. 26 and Chopin's Sonata No. 2.
If you like what you heard, please subscribe, review, and share on Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen. Thank you very much for listening.